Genesis chapter 21. Genesis 21 and verse 1. It says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. So the Lord visited Sarah. And this has to do with the fact that he opens up her womb and gave her the child that was promised to her and Abraham, which would be Isaac. So when a woman begins to be with child, this verse shows us that this means the Lord visited that woman and left something there. Look at that, how it's worded. And the Lord visited Sarah. Now, look at 1 Samuel 2.21. It says, And the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived, and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Isn't that something? The Lord visits a woman, and she's able to conceive. So God is completely in charge of that. Completely in charge of you having a child or not having one. So when a person performs an abortion, that's like ripping to shreds the thing that God left the woman. God paid her a visit. He left something there. And then you come in and rip apart his gift that he left her. So the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. And all the prophecies in the scriptures is what God spoken. And it came to pass. It's going to come to pass, no matter how far-fetched it may seem. You see, Sarah and Abraham having a child in their old age was very far-fetched. But the Lord said it would happen, and guess what? It came to pass. The tribulation and second coming are going to be like the pain of childbirth. God says it's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. A lot of the things in Revelation to people may seem a bit hard to believe, a bit far-fetched, but it's going to come to pass. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. It's going to come to pass. God said it would. You see, God knew Sarah would be in travail with Isaac that came to pass the tribulation is going to come to pass the second coming is going to come to pass the great white throne judgment is going to come to pass in Genesis 21 2 it says for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him so God knew when and where it would happen he knew all the details it seemed like Abraham would never have a son, but God can see into the future. It's like on a DVD when you go to scene selection. The Lord could see further in time and watch the birth of Isaac. Genesis 21.3 And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And that is exactly what the Lord told him to call him. In Genesis 17:19 it says, And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Now remember that Isaac means laughter. God had them call the baby that because it would remind them of when they laughed at the promise of God. Remember back in Genesis 17:17 17, 17, when Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. And said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? You see, Abraham, when he heard this promise from God, he kind of laughed a little bit because he's like, Man, I'm, I'm old now. How am I going to have a child in my old age? And then same thing with Sarah. Genesis eighteen twelve. it says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? my Lord being old also. Now every time they say Isaac's name, they're going to remember how they doubted a little bit. And that might sting a little bit. They doubted. But it came to pass. Genesis 21, 4. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. So physical circumcision was a requirement back then. Now... It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. In Genesis 17, 12, this is where God gives uh, Abraham the instructions on when to circumcise. And it says, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. 
every man child in your generations he that is born in the house are bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised that soul shall be cut off from his people he hath broken my covenant you see that's something they had to do they had to get physically circumcised but today this isn't something we have to do paul says in galatians 5 6 for in jesus christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but faith which worketh by love you see uh, it does not matter whatsoever if you get circumcised today it's not ungodly to be circumcised or to be uncircumcised you have people on both extremes i've heard people saying that circumcision is ungodly I've heard that just recently, somebody saying that circumcision is an ungodly thing. That doesn't make any sense because God himself is the one that told Abraham to circumcise on the eighth day. So how could it be ungodly if God himself said for these, all these people to do that for years? You know, circumcision is only wrong if you're saying it has something to do with your salvation or if you're saying it has to do something with your fellowship with God. But our uncircumcision isn't ungodly either. You know, people get they get into all that medical stuff about whether a person should be circumcised or not. I'm not a doctor, so I won't even talk about that. I just believe you have the liberty to do what you would like in that situation. Genesis 21.5 And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So Abraham was a man of faith he believed deep down that god would bring it to pass and he believed that god would bring him a son in his old age and look what happens and abraham was 100 years old when his son isaac was born unto him and now look at romans 4 18 through 20 where it talks about abraham again in his old age it says who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So Abraham, a hundred years old, he was an old man. He had a child. It was a miracle. Sarah was old. She had a child. It's a miracle. Genesis 21, 6. It says, And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. So now Sarah is laughing in a good way. There were probably a lot of friendly jokes going on. It was probably in the newspaper. Elderly couple has a child. A hundred-year-old has a child. It was probably a lot of laughter and jokes going on but this time it was a happy laughter not a laughter of doubt genesis 21 7 and she said who would have said unto abraham that sarah should have given children suck for i have borne him a son in his old age you see sarah is basically talking like who would have ever thought that we could have had we could have a child in our old age she says who would have said unto abraham that sarah should have given children suck you know who would have ever thought we could have a child this old. Notice Sarah mentions Abraham's old age here this time, and not her own old age. She's like, who would have thought I could have given this old man a baby? You know, it's almost like she's making a joke that uh, she's younger than Abraham about that fact. You know, my wife is like that. I'm, I'm a few years older than her, and she's always thought that I'm old. Even though I'm just a few years older than her, she thinks I'm old. You know, maybe Sarah's like that too. Genesis 21, 8. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. So this was a big thing for Abraham and Sarah. Just like any time your child accomplished something, you know, you want to do something good for him. The child was weaned and he could start eating big people food now. He didn't have to live only off of milk anymore. And see, in your Christian life, you also need to be weaned off the milk. You need to get into the deeper things of the Word of God. You need to start 
really getting into the Bible, learning the Bible, getting knowledge of certain Bible doctrines and, and all the scriptures, just daily learning a different topic, a different chapter, a different book of the Bible, just soaking up all you can learn. In Isaiah 28, 9 through 10, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. So we need to get weaned from the milk. It says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So you get in the scriptures. You're going to get here a little and there a little. You compare, compare scripture with, with scripture. Spiritual things with spiritual. You know, cross-reference your Bible. You're going to grow this way if you stay in the book. It says in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You don't have to give up the milk completely. But you also need the meat in Hebrews five twelve through 14. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those by whom... Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you need to get some meat of the word. This way you will continue to grow at a fast pace. Genesis 21, nine. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. So Sarah, she sees Hagar's son Ishmael mocking Isaac. Now remember that Ishmael is the son that Abraham had with Hagar. And in the book of Galatians, Paul says that Ishmael persecuted Isaac. In Galatians 4.29 it says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So it says here that he was, that Ishmael persecuted Isaac. And in Genesis 21.9 it explains how the son of Hagar, Ishmael, perse er, mocked the son of Sarah, Isaac. So Ishmael mocking Isaac is considered persecution. So this means you don't have to be whipped or die as a martyr necessarily to face persecution. It says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In Genesis 21, 10, it says, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be made heir with the son, shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So, you know, Sarah tells Abraham, Cast out the bondwoman, which is Hagar, and cast out her son, which is Ishmael. She wants rid of them, especially since Ishmael is picking on her boy. You know how you get when someone picks on your kid? She's like, Ishmael's picking on Isaac. You need to get them both out of here. You see, Ishmael is not the child of promise anyway. Isaac is the child of promise. He just happens to be the second birth in Abraham's life. Isaac does. And you see, you see, Ishmael, he came about between that wicked relationship between Hagar and Abraham. I, Ishmael came about that way. Because... Abraham didn't want to wait on the Lord. He was in a rush. You know, Sarah and Abraham were in a rush. They wanted to have a child quicker. So he had one by Hagar. But God's like, no, you're going to have a child by Sarah. So Isaac is the second birth in Abraham's life. This could picture your life. You see, your first birth was no good. That When you were born the first time to your mother, that was not a good birth. Ishmael can represent that. Your second birth is what got you in. That's the new birth. It's your spiritual birth. With this birth, you also got a spiritual circumcision. You may have got a physical circumcision the first time. With the second birth, you got the spiritual circumcision. In Colossians 2.11, it says, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You see, it's 
a spiritual one. It's made without hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You see, your spiritual birth, your second birth, came about the moment that you got saved. The moment that you believed the gospel. In 1 Peter 1.23, it says, Being born again. You see, you need to be born again. Your second birth is what gets you in. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So Ishmael can represent the first birth. It was no good. Isaac represents the second birth. That was the child of promise. Now back to Genesis 21. Genesis 21.10. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For, this, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And Paul goes over all this in Galatians. Remember in Galatians 4.22. He says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, the one by a bondmaid, which is Hagar, and the other by a free woman, which was Sarah. You see, Hagar is a bondmaid. And Hagar is the bondmaid. She and Ishmael can illustrate the flesh that keeps you in bondage. And you don't want to live after the flesh. It says in Galatians 4.23, But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Isaac was of the free woman, which is Sarah. Now Galatians 4.24, Which things are an allegory? You see, it's an allegory. For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage. Notice that bondage, which is Agar. You see in the New Testament, it says A-G-A-R for Hagar. That's the Hagar of the Old Testament. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So if you are a born-again believer, then you are a child of promise. You have eternal life that God promised before the world began. Galatians 4.29 But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Just like Ishmael mocked Isaac, the flesh, your flesh goes against your spirit. You have a war going on within you. Your flesh wants to go one way. The spirit wants to go the other way. And you could also look at this another way. You see, those who think they can earn their way to heaven through the flesh will persecute those who believe it is by faith. So they say things like, well, you just think you can live however you want to live and still be saved. You know, they mock and persecute you in that way. But it says in Galatians 4.30, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. What do you need to do with the flesh? Cast it out. Reckon your flesh to be dead. Don't walk after the flesh. Don't let it have any power over you whatsoever. I mean, don't give the flesh everything at once. Take cold showers. Don't eat every time your stomach growls. Don't constantly make your flesh comfortable all the time. Don't give in to the sins the flesh desires all the time. In Galatians 4.31 it says, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. You see, we don't have to serve the flesh. We are free in Christ Jesus. We need to serve Him. But now, I just wanted to show you how Paul goes over the same thing about Hagar, Sarah, Ishmael, Isaac, and Abraham and uses it as an illustration in Galatians chapter 4. In Gal and now in Genesis 21, 10, it says, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be made heir with, the son, with my son, even with Isaac. So Ishmael isn't an heir. It's all about Isaac. From Isaac will come Jacob, and from Jacob you'll get the twelve tribes. And Jacob gets his name changed to Israel, 
And that is why they are called the children of Israel. In Genesis 21.11 it says, And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Abraham had time to bond and be around his son Ishmael. Ishmael was probably a teenager at this time. And imagine having to cast out your teenage son. However, remember that Ishmael only came about because of Abraham's impatience anyway. But note it, you're going to notice that God gives comfort to Abraham. He says in verse 12, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, Hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now Abraham would do well to listen to the voice of his wife here. You see, before when he listened to her in regards to the situation with Hagar, uh, he really messed things up. So the rule is, hearken to the voice of your wife when she's in agreement with God. Don't listen to your wife when she's not in agreement with God. I mean, that's just simple there. Well, how do you know if she's in agreement with God? Well, you have to get familiar with the words of God. And then when you do that, you'll be able to lead your wife. The problem is that most times it is the woman who is the most spiritual person in the family and not the husband. Genesis 21, 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. You see, the seed will come through Isaac. And remember back in Genesis 3.15 what the Lord told the serpent? He said in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Do you know why the devil hates Israel so much? Because he wants to crush the seed. The promised seed comes through Israel. Jesus Christ comes through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob concerning the flesh. You see, he comes through that line concerning the flesh. In Matthew 1, 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And from Abraham comes Isaac. From Isaac comes Jacob. Jacob, what's his name changed to? Israel. From him comes the twelve tribes. In Romans 9, 3 through 5, it says, Paul says this, he says, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So the promised seed comes through the line of Abraham and through Isaac, not through Ishmael. Genesis twenty-one thirteen, And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. The son of the bondwoman, that's Ishmael. So God is still going to make a nation out of Ishmael. That's what God's telling Abraham to give him some comfort. You know, he's very grieved because, you know, he's having to cast out the bondwoman and her son. So God's still going to make a nation out of Ishmael. You know why? Because everything that Abraham touches gets blessed. In Galatians 3, 8, it says in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and thee shall all nations be blessed. This is comforting to Abraham, but you'll eventually see that the seed of Ishmael is a thorn to the children of Isaac. The Hagar and Ishmael situation itself was an attack from the devil against the promised seed. The devil knew the seed was, to, was supposed to be through Abraham and Sarah, not Abraham and Hagar. Genesis twenty one fourteen And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Once again you see Abraham rising early in the morning. 
This has been a key for me. Get up early in the morning. I've got a lot of work done early in the morning. Proverbs 6, 9 says, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Just get up and get going. Don't sleep the day away. Don't hit the snooze button a million times. Proverbs twenty thirteen: Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. So Abraham, he rises up early in the morning, and he gives bread and a bottle of water to Hagar and Ishmael. He sends them on their way. And notice that the bottle that he gives her wasn't like the 24 packs of bottle water you buy at the store. This was a, this was a big enough uh, bottle that she had to carry it on her shoulder. You see, Hagar was tougher than most men are today who can barely carry the groceries in the house. She had this big bottle of water on her shoulder and so Abraham gave her this bottle that she could refill. You see, out there in the heat, her and her son Ishmael are going to be drinking a lot of that water, and they're going to have to refill it and, and keep going. And see, Jesus wants to sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the Word. You see, when you've been all the way through the Bible and have your soul full of it, don't stop there. You're going to need to refuel refill get you a big enough bible with wide enough margins that when you when you're through it you can go back through it again and fill it up with notes again you can go back through it again and fill it up with more and more notes and more and more references get you a bible that you can refill i love to have a wide margin bible in Genesis 21, 15, it says, And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. So the water was spent. It was all gone. And now Hagar has began to hit rock bottom. She has been cast out, and now she is out in the heat of the day with her son. And she casts him under a shrub to block that son from baking him to a crisp. In Genesis 21, 16, it says, And she went and set her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and left up her voice and wept. So she went a good way off. And that, that's what we say down south. We say, you know, it's a good way off. It's up the road of peace. It's over yonder. You know, she set down a good way off, as it were a bow shot. So what's that mean, as it were a bow shot? Well, if you took a bow and shot an arrow, wherever it lands, that's about how far off she was from her son Ishmael. Maybe she didn't want to hear him suffering as he died. She's over there and lifting up her voice and weeping, and Ishmael is as well. It says in verse 17, And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. So God hears the voice of the lad. God even hears the voice of a wild man like Ishmael. You know that that's what it called Ishmael before. It said, he shall be a wild man. Every man's hand, his, every man's hand shall be against him and his hand against every man. And that's true. From him you get all these wild men that are still around today. So he hears the voice of a wild man who was just mocking. He had just been mocking the child of promise. He hears the voice of the one the devil was using to attack the seed. You see, God will hear anybody. In Genesis twenty-one eighteen through 19, it says, Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water after he opened her eyes. Remember that the water was spent in the bottle. Now she can refill it. Maybe it was there the whole time. Many times when you read the Bible, you won't see something. That is, until God opened your eyes. Now you see it. But it was there the whole time. And that thing that he just let you see refilled your bottle. It gave you some energy. It gave you a, 
a spiritual charge. So she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. I hope that God can keep filling up my water bottle so that I can give you a drink every time you listen to these studies. I mean, he just with this chapter, all these things, I when, I'm, when I read it, I mean, however many times I've read it, tons of times, I never saw a lot of this stuff I'm telling you now until God opened my eyes to it just this past week. And now I can give you a drink. And then maybe I can get you interested enough in the Bible to give your own self a drink. And then you can go on to the next chapter and study it and see some things that you never saw before because God's going to open your eyes to it. Genesis 21, 20, And God was with the lad, and he grew, and he dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. God was with even a wild man, and he grew. And God was with the lad, and he grew. You see, when you're with the Lord in the Scriptures, you know, Ishmael, he didn't have the Scriptures like me and you've got. But it says in Second Peter 3, 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the more you learn about God, the more you will learn about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you're going to grow in grace. The Lord's going to be with you. You see, Ishmael was going to die, but something opened Hagar's eyes. She found a well of water. She gave him some water. He received it, and he was still alive. Now he's growing. Now he's thriving. Now he's become an archer. And that's what happened for me. Somebody was obedient in getting the water of the word. And then they gave that water to me. And I passed from death to life. I was going to die. I was as good as dead. I was as good as in hell. But somebody gave me the water of the word. Somebody shared the gospel with me. And now I'm growing. Now I, I, I received that water. And now I'm growing as a Christian. But Ishmael, he dwells in the wilderness. And now remember, if we're going to look at Ishmael as a picture of the sinful flesh, that sounds about right, that he's dwelling in the wilderness. The flesh loves to wander in the wilderness. Instead of entering that victorious Christian life, the flesh wants to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. You don't need to wander, but rather get yourself together and do something. Live the victorious Christian life. Go into the promised land. It says Ishmael became an archer. As a picture of the Antichrist, that's fitting. Because the Antichrist has a bow. In Revelation 6, 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat, up on him, sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. See, Ishmael is a picture of the Antichrist. They're both archers. Now, Genesis 21, 21. And he dwelled in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. This is also very fitting. Ishmael gets him an Egyptian wife. And if you've been listening to these studies a while, then you have heard me explain how Egypt is a picture of the sinful world. Do you know what the flesh is in love with? The sinful world. It wants to be married to the world. So Ishmael pictures the flesh that wants to love the world and the things that are in the world. Many of you have took a drink from the well. Somebody gave you a drink from the well. You got everlasting life. You got some of that living water. You see, salvation is simple as taking a drink of water. Jesus is that living water. You grew a little bit. But after that, you have dwelt in the wilderness and married the world. And 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So don't love the world. Don't marry Egypt. Don't marry an Egyptian like Ishmael did here. It says in Genesis 21.22, And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phico, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. So now we're going to talk about something a little different. He says uh, to Abraham, God is with thee in all that thou doest. 
This should be the desire of every Christian. It should be your desire to have the lost world believe that God is with thee. I was listening to a person the other day, and they were telling a story about a man they believed was a Christian. They said that they could tell he was right with the Lord because when people would mock him and rag on him, he would never retaliate. He just took it and went on. And people notice things like that. When you go to work, do people think to themselves, God is with him? Or do they think, wow, this guy's nothing but a hypocrite? For most Christians, it's probably, wow, that guy's nothing but a hypocrite. I don't want to be a Christian like him. Genesis twenty-one, twenty-three through 25. Now, therefore, swear unto me here by God that that will not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. So here is another well of water. Some of Abimelech's guys had violently taken away the well of water. And I remember a long time ago, Jack Hiles had a sermon called, Get Your Stinking Feet Out of My Drinking Water. And Hiles had come to the conclusion in his Christian life that the King James Bible was the Word of God. He hadn't always believed that, but he had come to that conclusion. So he was telling all the Bible correctors out there to get their stinking feet out of his drinking water. Abraham reproved Abimelech because his men were messing with his drinking water. He said they violently taken away the well of water. You see, Ruckman, Peter Ruckman was called God's junkyard dog because he would quickly attack any Bible corrector or person that messed with the words of God. He would reprove them for it. He would get quite rough in his King James defense, and they would say, he's just being mean-spirited. He's a bit too mean. I gave some men a copy of Ruckman defending the King James Bible, and they said, he's just too mean. I, I don't like him. Well, he's reproving. When... When you do that, you're not going to be too sweet with it. You're just looking for a reason not to like him because you're afraid of him. Because he knows so much more than you know. You see, Ruckman's approach isn't my approach. My approach isn't too rough. My approach isn't sarcastic. My approach isn't very smart-alecky or name-calling, things like that. That's just not my approach. But remember that God can use any man's personality. Sometimes men are extremely nice, and God can use that. Sometimes they're very rude and crude, and God can use that. Sometimes men are sarcastic and quick-witted, and God can use that too. We are all different for a reason. You know, God has different people for different people. Genesis twenty-one twenty-six, And Abimelech said, I won't not who, who hath done this thing. Neither didst thou tell me. Neither yet heard I of it but today. Many times you should give a person the benefit of the doubt. Abimelech said, I woke not who hath done this thing. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it but today. You see, Abimelech had no idea. Maybe the person has no idea that they've wronged you in any way. Abimelech says, neither didst thou tell me. He's like, first I've heard of this. I didn't know about it. You know, maybe if you think someone is doing you wrong, you should go and talk to that person about it. You might find out that it's not intentional. People usually aren't as bad as we make them out to be or as other people make them out to be to us. I've found that out to be true in my life. You know, most people I hear people talking bad about, I go introduce myself to that person, meet that person. They're nowhere near as bad as the person said they was. Genesis twenty one twenty seven and Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. Why do people give to each other? Well, they can show they love that person or just out of appreciation. Many times I feel like I just need to give someone something. The feeling you get from giving can be much better than giving. But Abraham, Abraham took sheep and oxen, and he gave them to Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant together. 
It says, And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Ab Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. So Abraham sets out these seven ewe lambs. And I've heard some preachers tell the illustration about how this one country preacher one time called them ewe lambs instead of ewe lambs. I always thought that was funny. But these seven ewe lambs would be a witness unto Abraham that he had digged this well. You see, seven is the Lord's number. That is the number of perfection. If the Antichrist number is 666, then Jesus Christ's number is probably 777. But the Lord is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If you're saved, then you're one of the Lord's sheep. And if you're perfect, as in complete, then you need to be a witness unto the Lord that he has a well of living water. Just like those seven you lambs, or ewe lambs, are witness that Abraham dug that well of water. You see, those seven you lambs would be a witness that Abraham dug that well of water. We need to be lambs that bear witness that you can get out of that, get something out of that living water, the same well that we got out of. Genesis twenty one thirty one. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there they swear both of them. Beersheba means well of oaths. And the name came about because Abraham is here making a covenant with Abimelech. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. But Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. If you have read a lot of the Old Testament, then you know that the groves are placed in a very negative light. And people would only, people would, would take these groves and, and they would worship their idols in these heavily wooded areas. And this is because men love darkness rather than light. And in the areas of these groves, the shadow thereof is good, according to Hosea 4.13. You see, a grave in and of its a grove in and of itself is not a bad thing. Just like a Christmas tree, in and of itself, it's not a bad thing. It can't do evil. It can't do good. The average person with a Christmas tree is not worshiping the tree. They put it up in their house for fun and probably don't even think about it again until they tear it back down. Abraham is calling on the name of the Lord in the grove. And hopefully he continued to use this grove as a place to worship the Lord. But I'll speak more about an, an interesting thing about these groves later on in the next chapter. But Abraham calls on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, not on the name of a temporary false god like Baal or Ashtoreth. Genesis twenty one thirty four, And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines land many days. This is the land where you will eventually see the most famous giant in the Bible, Goliath. He's a, a Philistine. But that's been Genesis chapter 21.